Right, afternoon everyone. Afternoon, uh, my name is Alex Buchan and uh, welcome to DTG's TV Transformer Showcase, day one. Our hunt to uh, discover the next TV Transformers. Uh, we want to celebrate innovative thinking in the digital TV industry and launch this showcase to uh, give a platform to those companies and individuals who have provided an innovative solution to enhance the viewing experience. Uh, the winner of this competition will receive 12 months of DTG member benefits and uh, an exhibitor booth at the DTG Summit, which is worth £1,000. And uh, you'll be hearing more about our DTG Summit uh, tomorrow. Um, two, two winners up will also receive 12 months of DTG member benefits as well. Um, we've had some uh, very interesting and exciting submissions, as you could uh, imagine, from a whole host of companies. And uh, it was very difficult to whistle this down to just eight. Uh, so to help us select the eight submissions, we enrolled the help of some industry experts. Uh, so I'd just like to welcome our panel of judges now. So judges, uh, if you want to just uh, introduce yourselves quickly and uh, just give a bit of information about what you're looking for in the process, I'll just uh, call your names out. So if we go to uh, Charles first. So hi, I'm Charles Dawson Experian. I run our international marketing across our brands, DTS, IMAX Enhanced and TiVo. At Xperia, we enable extraordinary experiences, making entertainment more entertaining, entertaining and smart devices smarter. Um, I'm really pleased and excited to be on the panel today and hear the pictures, and I'm on the lookout for solutions that make the customer experience move to the next level. Thank you. Uh, and then we've got uh, Kat. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Kat Tate. I'm the Business Development Director of SimpleStream. SimpleStream is a leading OTT software provider. We license our on-demand and live platform and applications to broadcasters, uh, media uh, operators, and brands, uh, so they can provide their own direct-to-consumer experiences. And I'm always up for and interested in new innovations that we can add to our architecture and ecosystem. Thank you, Kat. And then we got Xavier. Hi there, hi everyone, uh, Xavier here. I'm the AVP sales for Fastly for UK Central Europe. Uh, at Fastly, we provide an innovative edge compute platform um, that basically enables developers to move data and software logic closer to the end user to deliver fast and secure online user experiences. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. I mean, at Fastly, we're all about uh, innovation that drives uh, improved customer experience. So can't wait to sort of uh, uh, get closer to what um, those perfect innovators are creating for us. So very excited to be here. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, and then we've got uh, Yvonne. Yeah, hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Yvonne Thomas, strategy technologist at the DTG. Uh, so my main focus is really to um, to think about and, and look at uh, future um, yeah, distribution systems, whether it's IP or hybrid um, systems, as well as to ensure the, the best user experience. So the pictures that we will hear today and tomorrow uh, are a great fit to this, I think, and I'm very excited uh, to hear all of the eight pictures. And uh, good luck to everyone. Thank you, Yvonne, and thank you to all the judges. Uh, so uh, the judges are going to be helping us decide the winners. But uh, in addition, we also want feedback from yourselves in the audience. Uh, so 50% uh, will be on the judges and 50% will be on yourselves. Uh, we've given you all uh, £1,000 of virtual money. And we want you to tell us who you would back. So at the end of the presentations, uh, we'll put up a poll in the slide area where you can select your choice. Um, you'll also have a chance to uh, put some questions to the presenters. Uh, please do that from the uh, Q&A box, which you can see on the uh, platform. Um, if you just type your question in there, then I'll read that out at the uh, end of the presentations. So um, without further ado, uh, please welcome our first submission, which is Chris Woods from Spicy Mango. Chris, over to you. Thank you. Hi, good to meet you. Um, I'm the CTO of Spicy Mango. We're a professional services organization. Uh, we provide enterprise architecture and product development capabilities to the media industry. And I'm going to talk to you today about something called a device management platform. So we live in a hugely fragmented world, right? We have thousands of combinations of devices, operating systems, browsers, and versions in market. And across all these different portfolios of, of devices and the combinations of operating system that they run, the capabilities vary really, really greatly. So you know, as we start to evolve and expand our OTT platforms and we introduce new technologies such as HDR and HEVC, 4K, Dolby, you know, a whole suite of things, 
Uh, you know, these technologies tend to add a lot of strain to legacy devices and platforms. You know, uh, devices that are five to seven years old will have, you know, support requirements uh, for either video or capabilities, SDKs and libraries. You know, we could be embedding, you know, Facebook single sign-on uh, libraries and, uh, and such like. Um, it's getting very, very hard for an operator or a provider of a service to manage the quality of experience end-to-end -end for their users um, outside of purely the video chain. For me, this problem is about setting expectations, right? The supported platforms in the eyes of the consumer is really anything that a consumer can register and purchase and make a payment against. If they're able to access a service and make a payment, they expect to be able to consume the, uh, the content that that service is providing. But I think we've got a really, really big discrepancy between what a platform provider says is supported and what is actually working. You know, as we sort of talk to product teams and they say, well, you know, my supported roadmap is this list of devices and this list of versions. And we sort of compare that to what we see, you know, in data, you know, over a week, for example, you know, we'll see over sort of 250 variations of device and operating system and browser, people connecting in on things to try to consume and view the service that you would just never, ever think existed. And the problem is that, you know, this creates uh, a fairly hampered user experience when people try to access and play back and consume. Um, they've paid, they've transacted, they want the service, and they can no longer do this. And what then happens is it, it results in churn. People switch off, they want their money back, and they leave those negative App Store ratings that, that really, really damage that NPS. Um, and it's, uh, it's those App Store ratings that, you know, make people really decide whether they're going to install an app and procure a service. So we introduced the, the DMP, the device management platform. This really gives us some structured control over application and feature behavior. It gives us an ability to create sort of an infinite number of configurations based on environment profiles. And really, really critically, this is cloud and not client. We see so many people baking in rule sets into applications that push to an app store. Then when they want to make a change, they have to go push a new version of that application to you know, enable or disable capabilities or features. How does it work? It's really, really simple. So an application launches, it checks into the device management platform, and the DMP holds a profile for that device. That profile is returned and will denote a set of configurations for features and services that the application is able to provide. So you know, it's a very simple set of Booleans, true, false, on, off capabilities. The application is then configured at runtime and it launches and enables the capabilities inside of the application for the specific version of operating system, device, hardware that it's running on. It's simple and it's really scalable. Um, it's based on sort of if that, then this logic. So you create a profile. If a manufacturer equals X or a model equals Y, an operating system is greater than or equal to, then we provide a set of key value pairs effectively that allow you to enable or disable those different capabilities inside of the application. Um, it, it, it's really, really simple and quick to configure, and it's cloud-based logic and not client-side. So to enable something or disable something, there's no need to go push that technology out to an app store again, wait for that to permeate round. It's all done server-side and in relative real time. The use cases for this technology we think are really, really broad. So think of things like access control, right? The ability to disable uh, a, a specific application or device, prevent somebody from actually purchasing on something where um, they don't want, uh, sorry, slide problem there, what's happened there? Um, prevent somebody from purchasing based on uh, an experience that, they, uh, that, they, that they're unable to consume on. Um, we can talk about feature deployment, uh, operators being able to develop a feature or a capability in the background and then simply enable this at an appropriate time. Those applications are already going to be delivered to market. You know, you flip the switch and that feature becomes enabled. Um, feature management, there are scenarios where, you know, a specific feature may not behave on a specific device, the ability to turn this on or turn it off. Community testing, the ability to enable a feature to a specific group of users. This could be a beta group, an alpha group, a closed community, an engineering trial. But you can use specific device profiles or configurations to test this capability. Location is another big thing. The ability to support features by location, turning things on or off against a specific territory. Couple this with a set of location data from somebody like Digital Element, and it becomes hugely powerful. 
customer support, the ability to understand the, the, the profile of the device that the user is, is, is accessing on at the time that they're making a customer support request. You know, we've been able to test scenarios here of having real-time interaction between customer support teams and consumers and getting an actual reflective view of how the device behaves in those situations. Uh, I think I'm probably at my time allocation. So that's the end of, uh, of my presentation on the device management platform. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chris. Really interesting presentation there. So um, not any questions in from the audience yet, so we'll go straight to the uh, the judges. Judges, um, who would like to ask the first question? I think, Yvonne, you've got um, one, one lined up. Yeah, so first of all, thank you, Chris. Um, obviously, I'm having a couple of questions. Um, so I was thinking uh, about the marketing point of view. Um, how do you see this being, being pushed to the consumer? Is it really the, the service provider or the manufacturer who will um, bring the consumer towards um, your, your solution? Or is it kind of something that's being more broad? I mean, I, I can imagine, obviously, there's a jungle uh, out there of, of devices, platforms, uh, applications, um, what you just described. So um, do you see that there's really an interest for pushing such a solution, or do you also see an interest of uh, trying to actually uh, align the inter on interoperability of all those platforms and devices? So that's a really, I think that's a great question. I think a lot of people try so hard to solve the interoperability problems and it's fighting a losing battle. The reality is that churn numbers are through the roof in scenarios where people are able to transact and purchase and then not play. For me, this is a broader, uh, a broader discussion around as an operator, do I want to, to try to enhance the quality of experience to my consumer and, and, and save that frustration, right? You know, should I allow somebody to purchase a, a premium package with a specific feature or capability if we know that the device that they're going to consume on is not capable of playing this, right? A lot of the churn occurs very, very quickly from the point of transaction when they realize the application doesn't work or behave in the way that they expect. And as the data that we analyze shows, when people are trying to access a service on you know, an Xbox app or a, a Linux PC connected to, you know, Opera browser on their TV or something similar, of course, it's not going to work, right? When you talk to the operator or the service provider, they say, well, you know, the app's not designed, it's not supported for that device. I'm like, yeah, okay, that's fine, but you're not doing anything to prevent the user from being able to transact or go and purchase. So they go buy this with the expectation it's going to work, and the reality is that it doesn't. You know, the great thing about DMP, it's completely transparent to the consumer, right? They don't know. It's not something that they see on a daily basis, right? It gives the operator the ability to really, really fine tune and tweak the application capabilities depending on, you know, the, the, the profile of the device. If they find something in market or through testing or customer complaints that they know just isn't working correctly. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, thank you. Um, so uh, next we had uh, Kat, I think you've got a question as well. I did, I can really see the need for this, Chris. Thank you for uh, sharing the, the, the problem potential solution with us. Um, is, is, your, is, the, is your platform live and how do you, and, and how do you license it? Does it? Do you operate it on behalf of, the, of an operator or a, or a, or a brand or, or, a, or do they, um, uh, essentially license it from you and, and set their settings and workings themselves? Yeah, good question. It can be a little bit of both, right? So in some scenarios, operators will take this and will train teams of people either through technology or product or customer support to operate this. You know, it's very UI, right? I think a lot of these tools tend to be, you know, scripts or code, which make it very, very hard. We've tried to make this incredibly friendly. So from a product manager's perspective, you know, they can go in, they can search for a particular browser type or device type or profile, you know, through a structured query and then make that change. We have the ability to operate that for people, um, but it, it's so easy to do. We really try to promote people to go in and, and use this and own it and manage it themselves. And, you know, we get the ability of, of being there to kind of support them and, and help with some testing scenarios as they come up. Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, right, we've got one further question from the judges, at least. Uh, so, uh, Charles? 
Yeah, hi, Chris. Thanks. Great presentation. Um, I was just interested okay. in uh, how are operators doing this themselves? Because I'm assuming that some of them are probably trying to do this themselves. And, and what's the advantage of them coming to you to do it rather than a, a build it themselves solution? Yeah, very good question. So we've got a lot of capabilities in this area. We already have a lot of knowledge of, and device profiles that already exist behind how a lot of the devices that are in market work. The way that many people try to do this today is by baking these configurations into apps, right? It's not server-side control. So we go into discussion after discussion where the provider says, oh, well, we do this today, and it's baked in the app. I'm like, okay, well, if you want to change it, what happens? Well, we just, you know, we push a new build to the app store, right? And that's fine, but we all know how long it takes you know, those changes to permeate down to the consumer for them to go to the app store, to check in, to download the new releases, you know. So, you know, I think there are there are different ways that people solve the problem. Most of what we see is client side implementations and it's certainly not real time, right? And they don't have the level of granularity to make changes based on specific environment profiles. So what they tend to do is say, okay, well, you know, we don't support a specific browser, right? And they broaden that to, you know, let's say Internet Explorer. Well you know, IE may work on some modern variants of devices. So, you know, your, your total addressable market starts to reduce if you make very broad sweeping statements. You know, this solution allows you to get down to a level of granularity and then sort of change this in real time, you know, server side and see how applications behave there and then rather than having to wait for those kind of changes to be deployed to an app store and then pushed out to the market. Thanks a lot, Chris. Great, thanks. Uh, we've had a Thank question you. in from uh, our attendees today. So this is from uh, Nigel Prankart from uh, Panasonic TV manufacturers. Uh, and this question is, uh, how does this apply to TV receivers where applications are typically tested against the device before the platform slash manufacturer allows an application to be available to the customer? Yeah, so that's a really good question. I think generally in those scenarios, the applications are tested before distribution, but the level of regression test that goes on in an application as the application develops and grows over time tends to dwindle. Most manufacturers will retest their apps against very specific variants or newer variants. What they don't tend to do is maintain often, you know, laboratories with sort of 20, 30, 40 brands of, you know, connected device and TV set to make sure that those applications continue to work perpetually. So in that sort of case where the DMP is very, very useful is being able to instigate you know, a, a change or a tweak to a little piece of behavior that you know is causing a significant problem or an application crash you know, almost in real time. It reduces your need to have to be, you know, let's say, as thorough across such a wide, wide range when you know that you can make a change very, very quickly without having to go redistribute the application each time. Great, thank you, Chris. Um, so I don't think we've got any more questions from the judges. Um, there's one uh, question I had, which was, uh, how does the uh, kind of maintenance work if, if new field features uh, are to be built in and things like that? Yeah, really easy. So generally, we talked about the sort of notion of a key pair, if you like, right? So uh, we build inside of the DMP a new application feature, right? It could be Facebook, SSO, uh, that could be a true, false, or an on or an off. So generally, as you're building your applications and you're developing, there's two pieces of development that need to be done, one inside of the application to allow the functionality to behave, and then the other to set the configuration inside of the DMP. And as you launch the DMP and you launch the application, they sort of check in with each other, and then at the same time, they, uh, you know, the application receives the configuration that the DMP provides. Okay, thanks. So, uh, yeah, all sounds very straightforward. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, thank you <laughs> Maybe. for that, Chris. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> very interesting presentation. Um, I don't think we've got any more questions on this one for now, um, but uh, as if you think of something further down the line uh, in the audience there, uh, then please uh, use the QA function. Um, so now we're going to move on to our next presentation. Um, so this is uh, Paul Bajarski from Scenic. Uh, Paul, over to you. Uh, thank you, Alex, and, and good afternoon to everyone. It's um, it's really it's really nice to be uh, here to present to you. Um, so I want to take your mind back to before COVID. Um, Forty-eight percent of people uh, we would get together to watch a big sporting event, um, big OTT events, and and do this uh, gather together. 
But even before COVID, the other 52% of people, as Laura says on Twitter, um, should watch with her twin brother who lives 300 miles away, American football, and they'll be using FaceTime uh, to sort of watch it together remotely. And over here, uh, Zoe says, you know, having a glass of wine before I'm about to FaceTime my friend and watch the, um, and watch the bodyguard on, on BBC iPlayer. And of course, uh, during the NFL draft over the pond, uh, people were using Zoom uh, to watch the NFL draft together. And I think um, the next video of the, of the WhatsApp group, um, we can all relate to this sort of situation as well. Uh, that's a picture of uh, Manchester United losing to Newcastle, which I found very amusing. Was that in your living room? Or in, in your... Li and so we all know those situations. And this is why we decided to build uh, Watch Together, an API and SDK solution. It's a really simple set of APIs and SDKs for media companies, OTT vendors, broadcasters, cable operators to take and bring into their own platform. So it's not a second screen experience. And so let me show you what it looks like for the end user once one of our clients has implemented it. You open up your favorite uh, TV app, smart TV app, it can be on the laptop. Uh, once our technology is integrated with our client, your, your users can watch together inside your OTT app, your TV set-top box, uh, with SDKs available across all of them, and have that audience integration there. So how does it work on the top level? Our SDK goes alongside your player, your OTT, into your CMS. You also get, uh, obviously, mobile SDKs, we have set top box SDKs across RDK, um, laptops, and even streaming devices. And of course, you get a reporting dashboard to see you know, how much, how many people are watching in what groups, how long are they spending there. Everything is GDPR compliant. So we already are live and power watch together experiences for BT Sport inside their iOS and Android apps. Uh, for NPO in Holland, which is the Dutch national broadcaster on their OTT service called NPO Start, La Liga Sports TV OTT, uh, Eurovision Song Contest, even some telcos like Oredu's, Oredu in Qatar, and um, even vendors like LiveLike. So let me show you what uh, the BT Sport experience looked like. Some of you might have tried it here in England. Um, you, you log on to BT Sports app, you choose what you want to watch, but now this extra functionality is available to you. So just like normal, you would select what you want to watch inside BT Sports app, invite your friends. This can be through SMS, push notification, uh, WhatsApp, Viber, and then they are legally watching. It's not screen sharing. So everybody's now four people watching together. Beautiful 5-1-0 uh, Liverpool last year um, or, or this year as well. And this is now the experience inside BT Sports uh, app. Another one of our clients I mentioned, NPO in Holland, it's the same. They launched first on uh, web and mobile web. And now they're even allowing celebrities uh, to request to come into your room or you can ask celebrities to join you for two, three minutes inside your room, uh, take a virtual selfie and then move on. Also, we do a lot of with eSports. Uh, we essentially replace the text chat on eSports with now a, um, pub, uh, with a private video chat. So it's a, it's a private video experience uh, with your friends and not seeing sort of emojis and, and, and uh, abusive text chat on Twitch go by. Uh, and even we brought it to set-top boxes. Um, oh, sorry. And we've also brought this to set-top boxes, so we have an SDK uh, for that. Um, typical group size that we see, uh, the most popular is two people watching together, 83% of the traffic we see going across our systems, 11% um, three people, and 6% uh, four people are the sort of groups that we're seeing 
um, currently. Uh, we've also done things with the UK government on 5G Edge, so our technology can be deployed on the edge. And of course, it runs over 5G. So just to summarize, we power these ex Watch Together experiences inside our clients' platforms. And also, we partner with uh, some OTT vendors uh, and middleware. Um, and yeah, this is Watch Together. Thank you very much. Great, thanks very much, Paul. Um, yeah, and I can uh, empathize with that kind of uh, use case as well, because I watch a lot of sport on TV. And with the uh, pubs and everything being closed, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's very difficult to get that kind of same experience anymore. So, um, yeah, so it looks like a very useful application. So uh, we've got some questions from the judges. Uh, Xavier, I think you had one uh, ready to go. Yeah, thank you for that. Thank you, Paul. I mean, that was, um, that was really, really interesting, uh, amazing idea. I think the question I would have is probably um, how do you link the actual subscriptions to um, the scenic experience? Meaning, can I invite people that are not subscribers of a service, like the example of, uh, uh, of BT Sport? How do I uh, invite my community um, or all my friends, sort of uh, um, scenic customers, or can they not be, and then I can integrate them in my community? Can you please elaborate a little bit on the actual use case? Yeah, sure. It, it cut out a little bit towards the end, but uh, I hope you can hear me. Um, so, um, because Scenic, we're not the platform or we're not the app. We're always integrated into our customers' uh, apps as a, as a white label API. So inside BT Sport, um, you can invite friends who are not BT Sport subscribers. But uh, since BT Sport is a paid subscription service, if you invite somebody over WhatsApp or SMS or, or whatever, uh, and they don't have a BT Sport subscription, they'll be offered to buy a BT Sport subscription. So it's also a revenue uh, and customer acquisition uh, driver for, for BT. So you can invite non-BT subscribers and subscribers. And if the, if the service is paid, then, then they will have to, because at the end of the day, we want to drive um, new subscribers. With NPO, it's a, it's a public broadcaster like BBC. And you can, anyone can watch for free, because it's a public broadcaster. Yeah, so Paul, uh, we've had a question from the audience which is related yes, to this. You. Is uh, from Nigel again at um, uh, Panasonic. So, yeah, um, he, he's saying uh, where you've got people sharing that have not purchased the rights to view, surely this impacts the content rights. And could this not also impact the rights of the uh, content under the rebroadcasting licensing? Uh, sorry, I missed the first part of the of the question, Alex. The first part was, um, how does this affect program slash event licenses? So where you um, are sharing uh, with other people who have not purchased the rights to view this, surely this impacts on the, on the content rights. Um, yeah, so, so I guess um, yeah, yeah um, I think I said it too quickly. Um, nobody is screen sharing. Nobody is mirroring. Everybody that you invite, say, to the BT Sport app, actually opens on their mobile the BT Sport app. Nielsen or whatever, you know, tracking that BT Sport records, registered another user. So I just want to make it clear. It's not screen sharing. It's not uh, casting, mirroring. Everybody is legally watching their own copy, just like you'd be watching on your mobile. But on the side of it, you have a, you have a video call with your friends. So when there's four people, BT Sport is recording for people legally subscribing, paying, and watching or seeing ads. Okay, understood. Yeah, so there's no kind of rebroadcasting or anything like that. So yeah, that's how you do it. No, no, no. Okay. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. We we know that's that's we know that's illegal, and, and BT Sport know that's illegal, um, and at least in the UK. So no, no one's rebroadcasting. Uh, you're not doing what you probably do maybe on Zoom or Teams where you're screen sharing. And, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, that's that's illegal piracy. So, no, this is everybody is legally watching, uh, getting a live stream, Nielsen, and everyone is reporting three, four, five users, whatever it is. Okay, that's all, that's all clear. Thanks very much for that. Uh, Kat, you had a question next. I did. Uh, Xavier took my first question, so, but I have a second. Um, I totally get uh, how this works brilliantly for sport, um, uh, Paul. And this is a you know it's a fantastic um, uh, uh, piece of functionality here. 
is it in use with um, other genres across some of your client base? And how is it how is it doing with like a peak time dra- peak time drama, for example? Uh, is it being used across more than sport uh, across your customer base at the moment? How is it faring? Uh, yes, um, thank you. Thank you for that question. So um, uh, NPO being a, a, a public broadcaster, um, they're, they're actually favorite um, co-viewing uh, program, Watch Together program, is about farmers dating, um, dating people. Um, so uh, we, we found that, yeah, it's reality TV. And, uh, and that's the most popular uh, program um, there. Um, so it's, it. it's, yes, we, it, yeah, um, it's, uh, it's uh, we, we've started with sport, obviously, uh, BT Sport were the first, uh, the first ones. And then we have La Liga, uh, but we also have, uh, like we said, uh, NPO. We're just about to have a German client go live with music concerts. Um, so, you know, there is no audiences in music concerts at the moment. Um, and, and they will, um, that's going live in uh, first week of October uh, from an extremely big client in Germany. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's going to be our first music deployment uh, for a music client. Um, Thank you. Thanks very much, Paul. Interesting. And, um, yeah, I think Charles has got another question, I think more of a technical one. Charles? Yeah, thanks. Um, being from Newcastle, I really liked your WhatsApp clip. Um, it was a, very appropriate. Um, I had a quick question on how do you deal with any latency problems between the different people who are viewing? Um, the last thing you want to do is hear one of your friends scream because they've had a, seen the goal being scored and it hasn't yet appeared on your screen. So are you doing anything to deal with those kind of issues between people u- using various different types of clients? Yes, yeah, so uh, BT Sport uh, rip, um, deployed on iOS and Android, and we know HLS and MPEG Dash, which are the streaming technologies uh, those respective platforms use. Um, not all not all our clients have some kind of CMAF or, or one second latency live streaming solution. So you're right, our video chat will be completely, um, you know, uh, zero latency or, or 20 milliseconds. So I will scream go or or or, or, or something, and and my friend on an iOS device uh, might see it actually 30 seconds later. So um, what we did was uh, we as Scenic wrote into our SDK uh, a script that communicates with the player, with the video player. We don't speed up the CDN. We can't speed up HLS and MPEG Dash. But what we do is we do a little bit of clever tweaking on the video player side to basically bring everyone together and then just to make sure they're together, right? So yes, one person will slow them down a little bit. One person will speed them up till they come together. It's, it's, a, it's a temporary solution. Um, but it's the one till we till all our clients have some kind of CMAF or uh, or, or, or one second latency uh, low low HLS uh, latency uh, live streaming. So yes, we do have a piece of code that synchronizes all the players across iOS, Android, uh, streaming dongles, um, and just keeps everyone. And we check every three seconds from the master to the participants in a, in a room. Um, is you know is everyone pretty much, uh, and we try to synchronize down to uh, 500 milliseconds um, of the of the broadcast, so no one sees a spoiler of a goal. But it's a very good question, um, uh, Charles. Thank you, Paul. Uh, we've got one question from Yvonne, and then we've got another one from uh, the audience as well. So Yvonne. Yeah, thank you. Um, so actually, I'm having two questions. They're they're both related to your uh, future plans. And uh, so I was thinking, while I'm um, viewing with my friends and, and family, um, am I able to collaboratively kind of change the program if we all feel, you know, we want to watch a parallel uh, football match or, you know, anything else? And um, do you plan to build some sort of a community? Um, for example, I could connect with a with a random person somewhere in the world. So, so, so yeah, so a bit like Facebook, I was saying I see this person has specific interests, and um, let's take the football um, match as an example again. So, could I connect maybe with a with a fan from from the other uh, party? So, how do you 
I mean, actually, yeah, intend to to extend your platform and this community thinking. Sure. So uh, two questions. So your first one was, uh, can you change to watch another program uh, once you're in, in your room, virtual room with your with your friends and family and, and, and start? That's actually from our clients, users. It's one of those requested. Uh, so move to different channels, different programs, but keep your friends in the room. Um, we have this functionality in our uh, in our SDK. It's now our end client that needs to implement, um, you know, next video or playlist and so forth. Then your second question on uh, it's almost like creating a social graph. Again, uh, because we're not the platform, it's it's BT Sport NPO starting to create social graph. We give them information uh, which encrypted uh, hashed user ID watched with who because we we have to hash everything so we are gdpr compliant um but um i think none of our clients are in you, you almost um, described a chat roulette or video chat roulette and this is uh, this brings in some problems right um it, it worst case scenario you know um 17 year old daughters watching and suddenly someone comes in from somewhere and does something nasty on a platform um, you can just see, you know, mommy, daddy, this happened and, you know, I saw something um, unpleasant. So watch together is, is, is I think, from our clients. Um, chat roulette is a risky, risky uh, business for privacy. And, and you, you, we could just imagine um, uh, we've had one client many years ago uh, try it. And, and I don't I have to tell you what, what happened on screen in one of the rooms when, when someone um, took out a private part of you know the body so we wouldn't suggest um none of our clients are going for uh, chat roulette it is a interesting how you connect fans but it's so risky online that it brings i think more problems um to do this um just from things that i've described so at the moment none of our clients are looking on on that at the moment it's up to you to invite your friends and family you have a unique link it's encoded and they enter your room Okay, thank you, Paul. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Um, yeah, so we've got uh, one last question, which we need to be a uh, fairly quick answer, if you can, Paul, uh, just because uh, in the interest of time, we've got to get on to the next presentation. But uh, we've got Andy Wilson from Friends MTS Limited, who's saying, uh, presumably, if the participants are sharing video of themselves while watching the game, does your client have the ability to filter background audio, such as a match audio, from the feed to prevent uh, breaching copyright restrictions? Um, the quick answer at the moment is uh, not yet. Not yet, right. Okay, um, well, um, maybe if there's a more detailed answer, you could get back to uh, Andy in the uh, Q&A, but uh, I think we'll have to move on to the next one. But thanks very much, Paul. And uh, certainly, I think you've tapped into something that's going to be very relevant in today's world as well. So, um, yeah, uh, very interesting presentation. Thank you. Thank and you. Uh, right, next one. We've got uh, Andy Doyle from uh, Filmily. So, Andy, uh, over to you if you want to introduce yourself and uh, away with your presentation. Thanks, Alex. So, hiya. Um, I'm Andy. I'm the founder and CTO of Filmily. Um, thanks for inviting us to present, and I'm looking forward to telling you about our product. Um, first, I'll give you a quick overview of what we do and then explain how we've pivoted our content creation tool in our post-COVID world, mainly to help sports, their fans, and broadcasters. Um, before we start, let's just put what we're doing into context. 43% of the world's population have an active interest in professional sport. So that's over 3 billion people. We can't underestimate the value of sport to the mental well-being of those fans. Sport provides a sense of belonging and a connection to the wider world. So what could be more important in these uncertain times than, you know, connecting with fellow humans and professionals who share the same passion as you? So Filmily is an award-winning platform that allows attendees at large-scale events to create and share content directly to the clubs and teams they support. This content is automatically uploaded from mobiles 
and analyzed using computer vision and AI. So we understand everything about what the person's uploaded. And obviously we do this with permission. This content allows sports clubs and their sponsors to automatically and quickly create branded fan-based films, which they can share on their social channels with broadcasters, whoever. These films can be created on a near live basis. This allows fans that aren't at the matches to join and see real fans enjoying the experience. And there's many reports and writings about how Generation Z and millennial fans have an expectation of seeing fan-based content and real sort of live, um, not curated content. However, when you make a startup all about attendees at events, you didn't plan for COVID. So in our new socially distanced world, where there's no attendees to speak of, stadiums are empty and the atmosphere is gone, the broadcasters are struggling to make sport programming world work. COVID has had a fundamental effect on live sport and also on their sponsors. It's changed broadcast and it's more importantly, the global fan base have felt isolated from sport. So with sport being played behind closed doors for the foreseeable future, or with very few fans in the stadium, this impacts TV viewers and the whole fan engagement piece. It also lowers athlete motivation and impacts the value of sports sponsorship to commercial and brand partners. This reduced exposure therefore has, the massively reduced exposure and therefore the value of the commercial partners in sports has come into question. Rights owners need to make good on the deals they've done with um, sponsors and broadcasters. And they also need to look to add sort of better value in the future. Teams across the world want to get back to doing what they're doing best, to walk out in front of a crowd and play their hearts out. They want to hear the roar of the crowd and feel the cheer carry them onto a win. Fans can't wait for sport to start again properly. They are tribal gatherings. The opportunity to see those they admire, the chance to play, to give their own vocal tribute to the greatness of their fan, of their players and fans want to connect with players and while seasons are played behind closed doors this just isn't a nice thing to do it's a social and commercial imperative so while stadiums are closed the only way fans can see their heroes is via the power of content on tv and social channels so with this in mind we pivoted filmily to directly address these issues stadiums and broadcasters have right now bringing virtual live fan engagement back into the stadium, connecting spectators and enabling them to share their experience wherever they are on the globe. Sorry, that didn't work, did it? We've partnered with global sports agency Wasserman and we've created Crowdamp. So please, let's just watch this promotional video to get an idea of what we've developed. Is that just playing? As sports fans and agents, we understand the importance of restarting seasons in the right way. Bringing back the atmosphere, not just the action. Putting fans' voices and faces where they should be, behind the net, courtside, and in the stadium seats. Building this connection is a social and commercial imperative. Creating shared moments to carry us through these times and helping teams perform at their best. Only authentic fan reactions will do this, which is why we created CrowdAmp. To enhance live sport with genuine user-generated responses. Fans access CrowdAmp through team or league official apps. They select the reactions they want to record and share their chants and cheers in advance and during the game. CrowdAmp curates and plays back real crowd reactions as the action unfolds on court, in stadium, or arena, sharing instant, authentic support to spur the players on. CrowdAmp will put fans right where they want to be and give the teams the vocal and visual support they crave. Break the silence and bring sport back to life. That's a clip, isn't it? Um, so you can see here, here's all the ways we can help stadiums, fans and broadcasters. 
So we can create, CrowdAmp can stream created and edited videos onto digital surfaces throughout the sports venues. For example, the jumbotrons, the gondolas, the LET perimetables. We can create grids of faces in pretty much any shape or size. In the run up to a match, fans can create, record videos of themselves cheering, singing, sighing, and singing the club anthem. Anything can be created. We extract the audio, we mix it together to create a real life fan experience. And these crowd noises are played out over the say, stadium speakers. We can create unique branded videos in mosaic form for each fan focused in the center. Every fan who records gets one of these branded with them as the star of the video award. And they can share this on social media, keeping the crowd feeling alive. We can also create personalized fan stories interlaced with niche clips from players. And these can be created as well. We can supply audio files curated for different scenarios at live events. These can be unique to each event. And that's the key, which, is, which isn't happening now. And they can be played over the broadcast streams. We can create new audio sound files during the event from the fans who are watching when they use their handsets as a second screen. We can also supply the fan content and video walls to broadcasters. These can be based on location, age, or many other parameters. So for example, a broadcaster may say, look at the excitement coming from Manchester, and then cut to 100 fans in a grid, all from Manchester, or cheering. So to summarize the crowd amp package, for players and fan voices, and the roar of them as a crowd, this enhances their personal performance. For those who support a team, it's, a way more, it's way more than a badge or a stadium. It's a community they want to be active members of. And this is critical for the younger audiences and an expectation. Leagues need to show support for teams, players and fans by creating unique and authentic ways for them to connect, especially in these unusual times. Broadcasters are key to all of this and they bring together a highly passionate and connected audience that can not only see but hear real-time authentic reactions from fans just like them. This attracts more viewers and generates more revenue. We let fans have their voices heard at a game and create a deeper emotional bond while maintaining social distance. And we can create an opportunity for team and league partners and brands to use crowd amp features to continue engagement with their fans and customers. So thanks for your time and uh, any questions would be lovely. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, great pitch. And uh, yeah, it sounds like a real uh, convergence of uh, devices and scenarios and, uh, and all sorts of different uh, kind of uh, aspects of viewing. So uh, yeah, that sounds uh, very, very interesting. So we've got a question from uh, Yvonne, first off, on the judging panel. Yeah, first of all, thank you, Andy. Um, that's a very uh, great idea, I think, um, especially now in thank the you. times of COVID-19. Stadiums are empty, so I think it's a great way for the athletes uh, to see some engagement. Um, I would be quite interested to see some some figures. Maybe you've done some studies of um, what the athletes, um, yeah, feel um, about the um, the feedback that they're getting through um, the social media. I mean, when they see the big screen and all the fans cheering while the stadium is empty. Is it something that they actually realize during a football match or is it something they just take away after after the match and just to recap uh, their performance? And have they, I mean, from the implementations you've already done, where the athletes, um, or did they feel they were performing better even? Is that some sort of engagement um, that they feel worthwhile for them during the so, so the feedback from... The main athletes we get to speak to are the ones which Wasserman are a huge corporation and they own the rights to do the media coverage for individual athletes, mainly in the States. Um, so where this has been used at the moment, because we're still, we, we've developed this <coughs> quickly from since March, a lot of these funk features. So people are creating content and they're playing them in things like the dressing rooms and the tunnels as they're leading out to the pitch to get the athletes going and feeling that walk. Um, that's been quite good. And athletes have sort of all volunteered, a lot of NFL stars, for example, have all volunteered to sort of 
want to sort of create sort of mini clips to interlace into stories with fans so they feel like that they're talking to the fans um one thing we're asked we've been asked to do uh, we're, we're just about to launch with the san francisco 49ers um one of the things we're going to do is record videos of people asking a question to a player and then those questions will be sort of automatically recorded and linked to that player and branded so there's that whole curation piece so there's all that sort of social side to it um in terms of the stadiums um we're going live on the 31st with the us open tennis that's actually our first live client for this um but we've managed to get feedback from other experiences where people have tried earlier versions with cans sort of cheering and stuff and the number one feedback is when you start hearing the repetition um it sort of doesn't it doesn't feel very nice so what we're saying is each game this content is new for each game and curated and some of it's created during the game so if there was a goal in minute 5 and we get lots of cheers in from the fans we can create those cheers for the goal in minute 25 for example so um it's all very new and i think it's a great question because feedback is everything but this is also new we haven't we haven't had a ton of it yet Thanks, Andy. Uh, we've had a couple of questions in from the audience. Um, first one, uh, obviously, as it's a live experience, um, you may get uh, bad language and things like that. So, John Chamberlain from Sky has asked, uh, "How do you go about preventing bad language and profanities ending up in the broadcast?" Um, okay, so the fact for that, and that's a great question. That's why we've seen people using Zoom, for example, and things like that in stadiums, which is obviously a great idea. Um, So we're near live so the content is curated it goes through our software as a service platform very quickly um and then an operator will quickly create a grid of say I don't know the biggest one we've created so far was 64 by 32 they scan through it and they can just go remove 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 of anything which is sweary or people showing things they shouldn't show we block out adult content anyway automatically um and then that's approved before it's pushed out to the jumbotrons um the same with the audio streams we extract the audio we show each stream individually and play together and if you hear anything you can flag it and remove it i mean the reality is though we got some feedback from one client in the US and they said the point is if you've got a thousand people all together making a noise if one person is swearing it actually sounds like a real game <laughs> Yeah, that's true. It's yeah. drained out, but it's drained out by the others, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, indeed. Yeah, yeah. Uh okay, thanks for that. And uh, we had another question which was from uh Rose. Oh, hi. Yes, I actually it was just answered. It was about the profanities and and what happened. So that question was answered. So thank you. Ah, uh, okay. Thank you, Rose. Thank you, Rose. Okay, I think we've got nice time for one. Yeah, we've got what time for one more. Um Kat, I think you were you were next. Thank you. Um and thank you for trying to fill um this incredible void having sat through a distanced comedy outdoor gig where the comedians just were desperate for any feedback from the audience. Yeah, I can right. feel the need for this acutely. Um just to build on the piece where you're starting to go to about about the I was interested in in what near live meant and uh and um and and just how you how you do that curation on the fly and how quickly you can do that so that you can replicate you know as near as instant reactions as possible um so i mean it all depends on what the output the client wants so we get the content in and analyze it i mean if it, the longer the clip the longer it takes obviously we analyze every second of the clip um and when we create a video wall i mean if someone scored a goal we couldn't collect a reaction and broadcast that up for that goal so what we're saying is is we can collect the reactions from so you know if people are singing a certain song in a stadium it's got a certain atmosphere we can collect them during the game and then use them later in the same game i mean the quickest wow. film we've done before covid we were working with FC Köln um, in germany and they were we were creating social content of the fans getting to the stadium the build up to the game and we produced the first film for them to put out within 10 minutes of kick off um So I mean we can create these video wars within you know 
30 seconds a minute. They're really quick because they're only short clips. Um, but yeah, that's why we purposely say near live, especially for the curation part. Impressive. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Uh, okay, that's all we've got time for for questions. Uh, but thanks very much for your presentation. And um, so we're going to be moving next on to uh, Rose Adkin Hulse uh, from Screen Eight TV. So, Rose, uh, over to you. Okay, hi. Um, I want to make sure. Can you guys see me in the live view? Oh, there I go. Okay. So, apologies in advance. Um, I am in tech, but there's a lot of stuff going on here. So, apologies if um, I hit a screen. That shouldn't be it. Um, so we are, I'm Rose from Screen Hits TV, and I'm going to talk to you guys today about what we're doing to address some of the disruption that's going on in the streaming world. So as we know, um, there's so many different platforms that are coming out from HBO Max in the United States, the Peacock, the Disney Plus. Um, a lot of the networks are looking to create their own streaming platforms if they haven't already. We saw the launch of BritBox um, last year. And it's just a really exciting time. Um, but with that, and with all the changes, it becomes quite disruptive to the actual viewer. And trying to kind of decipher between, you know, do I keep my Sky subscription? Do I kind of cut that and save money? And do I start, you know, aggregating and putting together all these different streaming services? Um, and it's quite a convoluted um, space out there. And so what we wanted to do was to use our um, technology that we built about 2012 um, to try to help streamline that whole process for the viewer. So before I go into just kind of some of the stats and what we've done, I'm just gonna show you a quick video. So let's see if this works. Push to audience. Another night in. What are you gonna watch tonight? Which app, what channel, can't decide? Well, you don't have to, because now you can find everything you want in one app. Meet Screen Hits TV, a brand new streaming platform that lets you bundle all of your TV apps and channels into one place. Netflix, yep, Disney Plus, Stars, and live TV, of course. Simple, streamlined, get Screen Hits TV. Everything you want to watch in one place. So let's go here. Let's just push this audience. Okay. So some of the challenges that we have been finding through our research with the customer is, you know, one, when they are, let's say on their Samsung Smart TV or they're, you know, using their, their tablet, they're having to switch in between different apps. So if you have more than two uh, platforms, that becomes quite frustrating because you don't know you know, if you want to watch something, you want to know what's available on, let's just say, Netflix or Amazon. And having to open up each app and go into it, it's quite time consuming. And from research, we found that the majority of people um, between ages 18 to 34 will spend maximum 10 minutes, 10, 15 minutes, maybe searching for something through all their different apps to watch. And as people get older, that number drops to five minutes. Um, and then there's a good percentage of people that if they're just kind of stuck, they will just forget about it altogether and kind of return back to traditional, t to, to traditional television. So we try to figure out how can we make that process easier for the customer? And so what Screen Hits TV does is that it integrates all of your platforms into one channel consolidator. Um, we use a traditional APG, so it's as though you're going on, let's say, Sky or Comcast in the United States, and it will list all of your apps in like a channel lineup. So you would have your Netflix, your BBC iPlay, your ITV Hub, your Stars, your Amazon Prime, and then to the right of it, it will give you a selection of shows that you can watch um, based on just your viewing preferences. Um, another really unique thing that we created that's not out there in the market is a homepage. But what's unique about this homepage is that instead of it showing you what's trending on one platform, it shows you what's trending across all your platforms. So in one quick glimpse, instead of having to switch between apps, you can see what's hot across your top five um, platforms. Another unique thing is discovery. I mean, this is a, a huge challenge that's happening in the marketplace because there's all these amazing streaming apps but how do you really discover content? How do you find that content? And what Screen has done is we, we kind of take the number one way that we all find content with our friends and we've created a share functionality. So people are able to actually share their favorite show with their friends. So 
my husband likes really dark, gritty, horrible things. So I was watching Ozark and I thought this is right up. And so I'm able to actually, when I'm watching it, go on there and click share, put his email address in, very simple. And when he opens up his Screen Hits TV on his homepage, he finds Rose shared with you Ozark and it's right there. Um, this does a few things. One, it helps with discovery, but it also helps push, push subscriptions. So if it was somebody, not my husband, but a friend of mine that didn't have Netflix, they would be able to, you know, see the trailer, learn a bit about it, and then they would obviously want to subscribe to Netflix to watch the show that their friend told them about. Um, another really unique feature that touches on some of the challenges is now with all these apps, you're probably going to be watching three to four shows across all of them because you wouldn't have them unless you were using it to watch something. But then it's like, oh, God, what, what, what channel was that? What app was that on? I can't remember. And who's really going to want to go through two to three, four apps to try to figure out where that show was? And our platform deals with that. It um, has continued watching whatever you've been watching, and it's um, right there lined up across all your different platforms. So this is this is different. Um, there's a lot of aggregators that are out there. We've seen it with um, Google. Um, um, we're, we're seeing it with um, Apple Plus, um, Amazon Prime, and with Samsung Plus TVs. I would say Samsung is probably more on the side of like a universal search engine um, where you can search for everything. Um, we're very different from that because we have decided um, very early on that we didn't want to overwhelm the consumer with more choice. So we decided to work with the premium um, SVOD, AVOD, and linear partners around the world with local um, key specific channels for those territories. Um, so the consumer doesn't become overwhelmed and they can discover content. And so I think that's one of the big differences um, from us in a device aggregator. Um, we also are able to have it taken with you. So I don't know about your household, but in my household, I don't have for Samsung smart TVs. I have an LG, a Vizio, a Samsung, and probably something from 1990 for my husband. So it's nice that I'd be able to actually watch it on different devices. Um, and then also um, what's quite unique, I'm just gonna kind of switch the slide for those that are looking at this, I'm gonna go to pain points there. Um, what's, you, what's different about us and Apple Plus, um, you know, it's probably more on the commercial side. You know, Screen Hits doesn't take these huge um, commissions or percentages from our partners. We really believe um, this is something that the industry wants, that the viewer wants, and we're really working to, to bring this um, consolidator to the market. So we've been able to partner with some of the best players in the industry, um, and we're working with them to drive subscriptions to them, to make it easier for the viewer to have bundles and packages. So instead of them having to add five different subscriptions at full price, thinking, you know what, I'm not gonna add five different subscriptions. I'm gonna just keep one or two for cost savings. What we're actually doing is um, creating these bundles that help um, a lot of our partners and viewers think, you know what, if I can get these five amazing SBOT platforms for this amount of money, they could easily compare what they're paying with their cable um, subscription to what they could pay for a SBOT package. And so that's another really interesting um, aspect of our platform. Um, so that's that's really much it. I spoke really fast, and I kind of got through all of these slides quicker than I thought. But I'm I'm very happy to answer any questions and just talk about what we're doing with some of our partners. If anyone has any. Thank you, Rose. And uh, yeah, as you said, uh, kind of the super aggregator is certainly a, a hot topic of discussion at the moment. So. Uh, I'm sure we're going to have lots of questions on this one. Um, so uh, I think we've got Xavier first with the first question. Xavier? Uh, yeah, thanks, Rose. Um, I think that was fast, but that was um, uh, very, uh, very interesting. I think that effectively that is a, a hot topic at the moment, this aggregator space. I would love to hear more about um, how you monetize uh, your platform. And do you feel yourself as more solving an end user issue? Or are you seeing yourself more as a channel for sort of uh, um, selling more subscriptions? I mean, how do you position yourself, and uh, uh, yeah, how do you how do you monetize this uh, this amazing tech? Yeah. Okay. So the first question, um, we monetize in, in various ways. It is free to the customers to um, use the platform if they're integrating their existing subscriptions. So that's kind of bringing people onto the platform. We then upgrade um, people to subscribe by doing a lot of unique things in our platforms like 
people sharing shows with their friends. Um, and then we do take a small percentage of that that we agree with our partners. Um, we have access to live television and premium AVOD channels that are packaged. Um, and we do charge a very small administrative fee for that, um, for those that do upgrade. So it's um, an entry level subscription. Um, and another unique thing about our platform is that a lot of our um, partners on the business side, so our content partners, they use a lot of customer acquisition companies where they're you know, paying sometimes 10 to 15 pounds per customer acquisition for a paid subscription. We are extremely competitive and we charge 30p per month um, whenever somebody gets a new subscriber through our platform. Um, and because we charge them just per month, what happens is a lot of customers will go on to, let's say Netflix, they will do a two month subscription and then they cancel. And that company lost, Amazon lost that 15 pounds of that customer acquisition because you know they, they, they disappeared after eight weeks. With our, our system, we only charge people um, as long as they are a paying customer um, and it's much cheaper. Um, so that's the way that we, we monetize and we also have partnered with um, WPP Group M and we're doing really interesting advertising on our platform that's strategic and targeted um, that helps to bring in revenue. So that's, um, we weren't really gonna push the advertising side, but we are gonna be doing really innovative and creative things that are not annoying to the customer. <laughs> And the second question was, um, do I see it for a consumer or for business? It's actually both. So I come from the business side. Screen Hits originally was started as a business-to-business -business platform, so it was created with the consumer in mind and also with the, the content partner in mind. Um, in this whole world with a lot of streaming platforms, people are just not going to get rid of the, the top three. You know, So the top two in the UK would be Netflix and Amazon. If you add the US, you have Hulu that's not gonna disappear. People are gonna be adding to those services. And so that makes it quite challenging also for a lot of the new amazing S-Bots that are coming out there and how do they do that land grab? How do they actually get customers? And our system actually is bringing in people that are S-Bot users that are cord cutters. And it's, it's, it's using algorithms and technology to actually sell directly and target the people that wanna see their content to help get more subscribers. And now from the customer standpoint, um, I built it for myself as well because I, um, you know, I during this whole lockdown, my my daughter who's now five was like, I need to watch something. I need to watch something. I was like, of course, I will definitely put something on. And one day, um, I didn't have the time, and so I just went to Amazon because I know that they have everything in their transactional department, and I rented Wizard of Oz, and she fell in love with it. Um, and then two days later, it was no longer available for rent, and my husband, who never pays for anything, he said oh, let me go to Netflix and find Wizard of Oz. And voila, it was there for free. And so I had paid for something that I didn't have to. And what our system does brilliantly is that you're able to just see whatever you have across all the different apps. And our research had showed, and I'll just finish with this one, that 95% of the users um, may have two to three apps, but they use one 95% of the time even if they're paying the full price for the other two subscriptions, on to the other two casually, just if they can't find something on the first. Our platform allows you to get your money's worth with all your platforms and to really truly discover content that is sitting there for you. Thank you, Rose. Thank you and now we have a question from Charles as well. Yeah, hi, Rose. Um, I had a quick question about personalization. How do you deal with the difference between a Solus viewer and a group of viewers in a household. And then also on the personal, personalization side, are you doing any interaction with the personalization engines in each of the different apps below you? Um, and how do you deal with when somebody's gone into those apps without going through Screen Hits TV? And that obviously will influence the type of content that's coming from those, that application. Yes. OK, so first with Screen Hits, um, you can create your own profile. So we have um, also children, we have parental control, we have a child profile. And when you log on, it's the first thing you see who's watching. So you click on that and then it tracks whatever you're searching for, what you're watching. Um, now, every partner that we work with, we use deep links or we have a redirect. And so because those deep links are actually playing on the video player, our partners own that customer relationship, but that link will pick up always where they've left off um, and, and, and kind of continue that kind of personalization. If they were to watch it, for example, 
offline somewhere else, it will still pick that up where they when they connect to that um, partner site. Now, if somebody just to go back to clarify, your second question was what happens if they're in the app, and how do we personalize that if they're outside of Screen Hits app? Just to clarify. Yeah, so what happens if they use Screen Hits and then they go off and they forget they forgot they've got Screen Hits and they use the Netflix app directly, and then they come back and then they use Screen Hits? Is, is that causing yeah, so, difference between so we, the personalization? Right. So if they're off, if they're not on our platform and they're on Netflix, then we're not we're not getting that customer data. We're not we're not getting what they're searching for, what they're watching for. But the only positive connection is that if they are on Netflix, say like they they've gone to Netflix directly and they're watching Ozark or Breaking Bad, and then they come onto our platform and then they search for Breaking Bad. Oh yeah, it's on Netflix, and then they press play on um, that. What will happen is it will automatically play where they left off on Netflix because it taps back in because they're tapping into their subscription via Netflix. Does that make sense? Your face, it looks, can, do you want me to clarify that a bit more? No, no, that's fine. I was just no, waiting for Alex to buy in. Sorry. Oh, sorry, okay. Charles. Yeah, I thought that was all good. Then, um, right, well, we've got, uh, we've got one last question, um, and this is from Nigel again at Panasonic, and he says, Bro, so what is the difference between your application and the features already available on a device such as a uh, Roku streaming stick? Well, then, for example, the share functionality, um, our EPG is quite unique and it's very different. Um, we also are not a universal search. Like I said, we work with some of the premium channels, so the discovery feature is a bit more powerful. And you don't have to have a Roku stick to use our platform. So with Roku, you have to have a Roku stick, but with screen heads, you can um, go on any different device, use many different, um, whether it's Google Chromecast or if it's um, Roku, for example, or you know your tablets, you can take it with you anywhere. Perfect, thank you, Rose. Okay, so um, I think that's all I've got time for in terms of uh, questions. Uh, what we're gonna do now is, uh, we're going to have the audience chance to have a say. Um, everyone's got a thousand pounds of virtual money, um, so I would like to know uh, out of the presentations you've seen today and all the pictures. You've heard some very interesting propositions there, and uh, all, all in very different areas, but uh, certainly very very relevant to today's uh, society and uh, today's TV viewing. So uh, what we want you to do is uh, put your money where you would. Uh, what your, or basically what your favorite is, uh, and then that will form part of the kind of overall scoring criteria for when we get to a winner. So uh, you should see a poll now on the screen. Just, can you all see a poll? Hoping you can. Poll is up, I've been told. So you've got one minute to uh, register your, uh, your vote. So, uh, yeah, I'd just like to say while we're waiting for that, um, thanks for everyone who uh, joined us today and thanks for the presentations as well. They were fascinating. Um, very compelling um, uh, propositions uh, from all of the uh, presenters today. Um, we're going to have uh, day two of this, part two of the TV Transformers Showcase tomorrow, where we've got four more presentations. Um, also, uh, we're going to be having a, a presentation from... Uh, Graham Lovelace, who's producing the DTG Summit, and he's going to be giving an overview of what's been going to be going on there and how you register and uh, some of the uh, uh, presenters and things that we've got going on there as well. So, um, yeah, I think that should be time for the poll to finish. Uh, George, can you just confirm whether the poll is finished? Poll is finished. Thank you very much. So uh, we'll uh, consolidate those... Uh, those results in with our judging scores tomorrow and uh all that is left for me to say is uh thanks very much to everyone joining us today um i hope you've enjoyed the presentations i very much have and i certainly learned a lot today and uh yeah hopefully you can join us tomorrow uh 1 30 and uh you should have received the invite but um yeah you can register on the dtg website if you've not seen that so thanks very much and uh bye for now and see you all tomorrow Thank you.